shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. O oh, tell of his might, to oh, sing of his grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopy space, his chariots of wrath. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, it is a privilege to be in your house this morning. We have come here that we may worship you and praise you, and we invite your presence to be here with us, that we, each one, will receive a blessing for being here today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church family. A special welcome to each of you this morning. I know that we have uh, spring, spring break for our school, and so I think we have a few families that may be uh, away this weekend, but we are glad to see each one of you and just want to enjoy this worship hour together. And any visitors who are here today, we want to especially welcome you and just invite you to come back. And if you're looking for a church family, a church home, we'd invite you to consider Holland. Well, we have um, lots of things going on in our church family here. In the bulletin, I'd like to just share and highlight a few of those items um, this morning. Um, the ministry placement committee, uh, there's a first reading in the bulletin. You want to read through that, and we should take a vote on that next Sabbath, so we consider that. And um, Dr. Brian Strayer is here with us this morning. Welcome to you, and we know that you'll have our Vespers this evening. It's a continuation of the um, life of Hiram Edson, uh, part three, I believe. All right, very good. Well, you, six o'clock tonight, you won't want to miss that. Please come out and enjoy uh, and learn some of the heritage and history of our church. Um, other things um, going on. I see that there is a um, visitor's day for our school coming up in April. So if you have opportunities to share that with uh, maybe someone that you know, a neighbor, um, neighbor or friend that has school age kids that would like to maybe consider that, just share that information with them. And then the food truck uh, is coming up, not this coming Monday, but the following Monday. Um, you can read in there about uh, how many families we served this last month. Um, tomorrow morning is a kind of a busy morning. We have a men's breakfast. Um, Pastor Gottschall is gonna be giving his testimony. Wonderful. All right. So guys, that's at 8 o'clock. And that those uh, who would who like to get up early anyway and help cook, you can be there early to help Jimmy with that. Look forward to that. And then we have a farewell, farewell um, brunch potluck um, for Sonia. And so uh, that's at 10.30 till 12.30. 
the multi-purpose room. Um, and there's other things as well, so I just want to encourage you to read through your bulletin, make sure that you're uh, updated, take the, a week at a glance, or, and uh, look at those things. All right. All right, well, we have a special treat now. We get to hear a testimony. It will be um, brought to us in the form of a video, so we'll, we'll watch that now at this time. Raised in a single-parent Adventist home, one of a set of twin girls, Sonia and Sandy, born to mom Karen, Sonia has a powerful testimony to the grace of God. Completing 12th grade through GLA, Sonia walked away from the church, spending the next 30 years avoiding living by the rules, making choices that led her further from her upbringing and from further from God. At a low time in her life, a friend of Sonia's mom called on Sonia asking her if she would like to study the Bible. Betty, a longtime member of the Jackson SDA Church, hoped to help Sonia understand how much God loved her. A year of studying God's Word and Ellen G. White's great controversy left her with a desire to know more and grow more in her relationship with God and a reintroduction to attending church. In early 2021, coming home to her new apartment after work, Sonia became the victim of a home invasion in which a gunshot wound to her head should have ended her life. But instead, God's providence stepped in. A work associate, having expecting, expected a phone call that didn't come, decided to stop and check on her. Finding her injured, she called emergency services. A quick ambulance ride to the hospital where few expected her to live. Three weeks later, waking up with a tracheotomy, a complete loss of memory of the event, and several weeks lapse of her life from August into September, she was amazingly still ambulatory. With mom on her knees every night praying and God's grace, Sonia slowly made her way through a lengthy stay at the Henry Ford Hospital in Jackson and another three to four months at Mary Freebed for physical rehabilitation. Sonia's physical strength returned, but many work, months of work was still ahead of her for the longer term brain trauma. Sonia currently resides at Care Cardinal Assisted Living in Holland. Prior to moving into Care Cardinal, Betty, her, friend, her Bible study friend, arranged for Sonia to meet Kathy and visit the Holland SDA Church. The rest of Sonia's testimony is in her own words. If I had died the night I was shot, I know I would not have been in heaven. I realized uh, no one can work their way to heaven. It's only by day-by-day -day walk with God and a personal relationship with Him that we can achieve that goal. Not only did He save me physically, but also spiritually. The first time I went through the great controversy, with Betty, I feared having to live through it, through the end time. Now I realize God takes you where you are and has promised he will never give you more than what you can handle and does and will give you a way to escape. Both my boys, Jared and Jacob, were not raised in the church. I pray every night that some seed will be planted within them that they reach out to God before he comes. Thank you, Sonia, for that testimony. It's, it's been neat and a privilege to have Sonia here at our church for the last two years, something like that, and we'll be sad she's leaving us. But please join us in singing again, Redeemed. <laughs>
his child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty the King in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeem I'll be singing Sweet, Sweet Spirit as we lead into prayer. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the This morning, I just wondered if there's anyone that has any silent prayer requests this morning. Uh, I don't see many hands. Would you bow or kneel with me this morning for a morning prayer? Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are grateful to be here in your house this morning. Lord, we humbly bow before you, knowing that you are our creator, God, our sustainer, and we are in awe of you. We worship and praise you because you uh, love us and you so freely forgive us, Lord, for when we let you down. And we just want to praise you this morning and worship you here this Sabbath morning. And Lord, we think of all the hands that were raised this morning, Lord, that people have a silent prayer request. We know that you know each one of those prayers, and we just lift those to you now. And Lord, we want to remember those in our church family who are uh, discouraged or or feeling sick and ill, we just pray that you'll be with each one. We think of uh, David Hafey, Paula's brother, Lupe Os Osario, Carol Madden, and Carol Elite. Lord, we would also like to lift up all of our families to you, Father, and just pray for your continued support and, and care for each each one, Lord, that you would build a hedge of protection around each family. Think of our school, Father, and each of the children, the teachers, and pray your continued blessing there that you would, um, that you would just do a mighty work, Lord, in our, in these kids, Lord. We just lift them to you, and Lord, we want to praise you as we 
heard Sonia's testimony this morning, Lord, and, and we think of amazing things, amazing miracles you still do today, just as you did in Bible times that we read about. We thank you for what you have done in Sonia's life and just pray a special blessing on her as she moves back to uh, the Jackson area and just bless her time there with her mom. Lord, we think of um, our country and the, the leadership, things that are uh, going on. We see events happening, Lord, that certainly point to your soon return. And Lord, while we look forward to that day, we do ask that you'll continue to hold back winds of strife, Lord, that we may... Um, we may be a, a lighthouse here in our community, Lord, that we may reach others who, who don't know about the love of Christ. May we share you with, with those people, Father. And in a special way, we ask you'll be with Brother David Escobar this morning as he brings a message to us, Lord, that you have put on his heart. I just pray that you would bless him in a special way and help our hearts and our minds to be open and receptive, Lord, to what you have for us to learn today. And Lord, now we just ask that you'll uh, bless us the rest of this Sabbath day. May everything that we say and do bring honor and glory to your name. And we ask these things in the precious and dear name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Happy Sabbath. The, script, the scripture reading for today is Psalm 34, 1 through 3, and 8 and 9. Psalm 31, 34, 1 through 3, and 8 and 9. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. 8 and 9. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. Today's offering is <clears throat> Michigan Advanced Partners. In early 2020, the McMillan Northwood Church began considering how they might reach into the community and also have a way to draw the community in. They wanted to begin to have a bigger footprint in their district. As the world began to shut down due to the worldwide COVID pandemic, the desire to have a stronger digital presence and the need for equipment to present, prepare, and distribute digital media became stronger. The only thing standing in the way was a severe shortage of funds. Times had been hard. Special appeals had been made to help get the church back on good financial footing. Many were the projects that needed attention with work needed on the roof, the need for a ramp, and the changes taking place in the world. Was this what the Lord wanted them to do? Prayer and several meetings later, the consensus came, and if the Lord would provide the way, the church would move forward. A request was made, and MAP was made a available to be able to answer their prayer. Now the church has internet access, a streaming computer, and has participated in both Hope Awakens and Revelation Now. 
Members have been blessed, the worship experience enhanced, and the online videos and DVDs they are sharing with their friends and neighbors are helping the gospel look even more attractive. Several connections have been made in the community and Bible studies have been initiated. Will the deacons please come forward? This is the mission of MAP, the opportunity for every member to be able to help expand the reach of the gospel through local projects. Whether it's maintaining current facilities or projects or beginning something new, your gift to MAP is going to help keep the gospel fresh and relevant and take it to the world. Thank you for your support as they help to advance the work until Jesus comes. Let's have prayer. Dearly Father, thank you so much for a chance to share a few of the things that you've given to us. Just show us how we can be as generous with our gifts as you have been to us and just uh, help, help us to know how to finish the work so that we can all go home with you soon and just thank you for this chance to be part of your plan. Be with us now, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. kids it's now time for the children's story and Nora Slickers has a good one for you
Good morning, boys and girls. There aren't many of you today, huh? But we're glad you're here. And the past few weeks, Pastor Lambert's been talking about the same story, a continuation of it. Do you remember who it was about? Saul, that's right. And you know, I found this story pretty interesting. I'd read that story many times. But every time I read a Bible story over, it seems like I learn something new. So remember that, that you may hear the story, but every time you hear it, you'll be impressed with something else. And something that I thought of this week is, how would you like for your name to be Kish? You'd get teased a lot, I'm sure. Well, this was Saul's father's name. And you know, it, in the story of this, it goes back and tells you who his father was and his father was and all the way back. And you know what? Most of those names I can't even pronounce. But it doesn't matter because Kish was a very wealthy man. Don't know why or how he became wealthy, but he was. And that was Saul's father. And one day, what happened? Some donkeys got lost, didn't they? And so what did Kish do? He called for Saul and a servant. And he said, go find those donkeys. Well, now your dad probably has never told any of you to do something like that, has he? So they went out. They looked everywhere. They went to all regions around where they lived, and no donkeys showed up. So Saul says to the servant, I think we just need to go home. It's a lost cause. We aren't going to find those donkeys. But what did the servant remember? Go find Samuel. That's right. He said he lives, he's nearby, and he's a servant of God. And if we go there, I think he might be able to help us find those donkeys. But God had something else in mind, didn't he? And God told Samuel, tomorrow about this same time, da-da-da, someone's going to come. And that's going to be the leader of my children. So it happened just that way. They ended up spending the night there. Samuel woke them early the next morning so they could go home. And he said, as they were leaving, Tell your servant to go on. I need to talk to you alone, Saul. And what happened? That is very true. He anointed Saul. And he said, God has chosen you. But you aren't to tell anyone. And I'm going to give you three signs that you know what I'm telling to you is God's assurance that you will be the leader. Do you know what those three signs were? The first one was, when you start home, and Saul, uh, Samuel gave very distinct places where these three signs would take place on his travel. And one was, you're going to meet two men, and they're going to tell you not to worry that the donkeys have been found. Okay, so it happened. The th second thing was, at a certain spot, you're going to meet three men going to worship in Bethel. Do you know what they were carrying? Three baby goats, three loaves of fresh bread, and some grape juice. And he said, they're going to offer you a loaf of fresh bread, and you are to take it. And then the third thing, which was really amazing, at a certain point on his journey home, you're going to meet students from the schools of the prophets, and they're going to be singing songs, and they have instruments, they're playing them, and you're going to join in singing with them songs you've never sung before. I thought that was pretty amazing that Samuel reassured him. And as Saul left Samuel, 
God created a new heart within him, and the Bible says he was converted. And everything on his journey home happened just the way Samuel had told him it would happen. And from this story, what I want you to remember is that sometimes we do things that we don't really want to do. Sometimes we say things that hurt other people. But any time, whatever you have done, Jesus is able to create a new heart within you that will help you be a kind person. Father, I thank you for the stories that you have given to us. And I pray that each person here today, not just the boys and girls sitting in front here, that you remind us that if we come to you, you are able to create a new heart within each one of us. We love you. We praise your name. Amen.
Thank you, Amy. You blessed us. Because he lives, you know the rest of it. What can I do? I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. It's in your hymn book, isn't it? It's a good one to remember. We can face tomorrow because he lives. Hebrews 4.16, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Anybody need any help? <laughs> let us find grace to help us in our time of need. My time of need is right now. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, what a privilege it is to worship you together in your house and on your special day. Can't thank you enough, Father. We thank you for this church and the blessing it is to so many of us, Father. And this morning, we invite your spirit to continue to be with us. We've already seen you here through the music and through the all the other the stories and continue to speak to us, Father. May we hear your voice. And Father, I want you to take over my mouth. The words that I speak, may they come for you. May they be inspired by you, Father. Thank you for your promise to be with us is my prayer in Jesus' name, amen. A couple of weeks ago, maybe it was a month ago, Jim asked me to, to give my testimony to the men's group, and uh, I did. It was good for me because I could look back at the way God blessed my life. And when we were through with that, the pastor says, uh, Dave, you need to share that with the church. And I said, well, I've already shared it with the men. And uh, some of them, there were about 10 of you there. He says, you need to share it with the church. I said, I, I'm not sure. You know, that's a sermon. He says, it's a sermon. And uh, he said, you pray about it, and I'll pray about it. See what the Lord tells you. And I did pray about it for a couple of weeks, in fact. And he and I would talk from time to time, and he would say, the Lord indicate you should do it. And I didn't get any negative from God, and I did get a few things that happen that, yes, maybe I should do it. I mean, one thing that I pray for often, every day in fact, is Lord, give me an opportunity to share you. And so when the pastor asks me, I'm thinking I prayed that prayer. So, okay, I will do it. And uh, that's what we're gonna do this morning. God's amazing. He is amazing. You see it, don't you? you love the Lord for a long time. And he answers our prayer. And sometimes, think about this, you think about your own experience. Sometimes he answers our prayers before we pray. Have you ever had that experience? Yeah, I see some heads going like this. I've had that experience. Praise the Lord. About 1935, my father was 19 years old. He was uh, a musician, played the piano, sang, played the trumpet, played the violin, several others, and he had his own dance band. And evidently it was pretty wild. He didn't know Jesus. He'd never read the Bible, never gone to church. His family was a good family, but they, just, they were not Christians, you know. Fortunately, he never got into the drugs and that culture at all. But he had this dance band, and they traveled all over, and it was evidently pretty loud, pretty wild. <laughs> Maybe today you'd call it a rock band, but then it was a dance band. And one day he was walking down the road, and he saw this huge tent. Looked like, you know, maybe it was a circus or something going on. And the Lord impressed him to walk in. I, th I think he heard some music because he was a musician, you know, and I, I th he never told me that, but I'm just assuming maybe he heard some music and he walked in this big tent and it was a evangelistic crusade going on by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. E. Torrell's seat was the 
was a preacher. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's been gone a long time. But my dad was touched. He thought, my goodness, how come I never heard this before? So he came back night after night, brought his sister with him finally. She was younger. And they both, long story short, gave their heart to the Lord. And he thought, what am I going to do with my band? That is not praising God. And he decided, done. No more wild music. And he started attending church. And he got quite active in the church. He was just a young young man, you know, 19, 20 years old. And the uh, members thought, you know, this young man ought to be in an Adventist school. So they talked to him about it. He'd never heard of an Adventist school. You know, I mean, I was never heard of Adventists before. And uh, he thought, well, that would be interesting because he loved the Lord. He really was committed to the Lord, and he wanted to go and do what the Lord wanted him to do. And, and he thought, you know, if I go there, I can study the Bible. I'll learn more. And they said, well, we'll support you. Student aid. And so they supported him, and he went into Pacific Union College, and he wanted to learn more about God, so what do you take? He took a theology major, you know. And uh, while he was there, I call it a miracle, he met an attractive young lady who became my mother. And I think if he hadn't have gone into that evangelistic tent and found Jesus, if the church hadn't supported him and sent him to Pacific Union College, I wouldn't be here. That's the prayer I prayed later. <laughs> I wasn't there to pray, I wasn't born yet. And I thought, what a, what a, what a blessing. And I think uh, to my daughter and my grandchildren, you wouldn't be here either. If God hadn't led him, I just praise the Lord for that. Well, uh, I was born during World War II, during a blackout. They were afraid of Japan bombing us, you know. And uh, my dad at that time was pastor of a church in downtown Los Angeles. He was young. He was, you know, he had just graduated from college maybe three or four years before. I had a one older sister, a year older. And, and uh, I learned to know Jesus. People have asked me, when did you accept Jesus? When did you give your heart to the Lord? I don't remember, because from the time I was a tiny little baby, you know, dad and mom taught me about Jesus, and I always admired my folks, you know, my dad, and wanted to be like him, and uh, anyway, I grew up. When I was nine years old, Dad baptized me and my friends. He had a week of prayer in our little school, and we were all baptized, and it was kind of the next step. I mean, I'd already belonged to the Lord. Even though I belonged to the Lord and wanted to serve him faithfully, I made mistakes. And I had to, I was human, I had to be punished now and then for, but I still loved the Lord and wanted to serve him. Interesting, being the preacher's kid, you know, Anyway, when I was about 16 years old, one day I was thinking, what do I want to do with my life? What do you want me to do, Lord? And I thought, well, you know, the Lord's coming soon, even though that was a long time ago, and I want to be ready. Why not, why not give everything to him? So I decided that I was going to work for the Lord somehow. I didn't know how, but I wanted to work full-time. Maybe he's a missionary. I don't know what it was going to be. One thing I didn't want to do was be a teacher. You'll laugh when I tell the rest of my story. But anyway, uh, uh, the next year, after I made that decision, you know, I was at Monterey Bay Academy, and I met this uh, young lady. Her name is Helen. And uh, we became best friends. We got married four years later, and what a blessing she has. It's an answer to prayer. What a blessing she's been to. She's willing to go all the crazy places I went. And she was such a blessing. I just can't thank the Lord enough for sending her to me. That wasn't that long ago. 
It was 60 years ago. <laughs> and uh, anyway, after I graduated from academy, I went to PUC and where my dad went. He'd only been there like 25 years ahead of me. And, and uh, what am I gonna take? So I decided to enroll in theology with a history minor and some biblical languages. And things weren't easy. I struggled with several different things. And several times I decided, you know, I think I'll quit. I'll go home. I want to make some money and buy a car because I don't have any independence. I have to depend on other people to take me places and so forth. And, and I'd go home and talk to my folks and they would say, God's got a plan for you. Don't let the devil discourage you. Stay there. He's going to bless you. He's got something for you to do. Thank you, Lord. And he did that several times to encourage me because uh, there were several times I thought, this is it. Anyway, got married to Helen the, between my junior and senior year. And my senior year, I was taking a class. I was still in theology from Carl Kaufman. Some of you might know what Carl Kaufman. He taught at Andrews for a number of years. And uh, I was taking the class entitled The Minister and His Duties. Very interesting. And uh, he would tell us, he said, you're seniors now. There was about 30 or 40 of us that were seniors, theology majors. Can you imagine? He only had two or three anymore, it seems like. And uh, he says, the Lord's going to call you. And you're going to ask, where do I go? When do I go? Who do I listen to? And he said, you pray that the first offer you get to ministry is God's call for you. Just pray that. And he told us that many times he would remind us, are you praying? You know, and some of uh, my classmates sent letters out to the conference presidents and saying, I'm available, you know, I want to go to seminary next year. And, and uh, I didn't write. I thought, the Lord knows where I am. He'll come and get me. I'm not sure what he wants me to do, but I'm, I'm prepared academically. And so, uh, I decided since I wasn't hearing from anyone, no one's coming after me, I would write. And I wrote to every conference in the United States except Alaska and Hawaii. I decided, where's that, you know? And I got letters back from all of them. I still have the letters in a file. They're beautiful letters from the president saying, why didn't you write sooner? We've already made commitments for this year. We don't have any more funds for this. And, but we'll pray for you. God will lead you. I did get a letter from the Texas conference they said, we're considering you, we'll give you, we need a couple of weeks because we have several other names we're considering, we'll get back to you. I was sitting in a, a class, the history of the Old Testament, and uh, Elder Hyde was the professor, very good class, and during a break, my friend sitting next to me said, guess what I heard? And I said, what did you hear? He said, I heard that the president of the Alaska mission is here and he's looking for a ministerial intern. He said, you should go talk to him. I said, Alaska? I don't, I don't want to go there. <laughs> he said, well, you prayed, didn't you, that the first call? I mean, maybe it would be, maybe he call you, maybe he won't, but you, you know, others went and talked to him too. And I did make an appointment and we talked and he kind of shocked me. He said, uh, you know, we're not sending our interns to the seminary until you've had two years of experience and then we send you to the seminary. Oh, is that okay? I said, yeah. He said, are you interested in coming? I said, I just have to pray about it. The Lord will have. He said, well, you know, we're considering several different people. And he said, let me tell you about, the, uh, about our pastoring. He says, all of our young pastors that come, they also teach school. I didn't want to teach school. He said, are you prepared? I said, I am not prepared. I haven't had education classes. Well, he says, if you come, we'll send you to summer school and you'll take some classes and you'll be better prepared to teach. But I said, what, what do I teach? Oh, ninth and 10th grade. Oh, what subject? He says, all of them. <laughs> You're kidding. What a shock. <laughs> So I thought about it and prayed about it. I'm not sure that's what I want to do. But then I remembered I had prayed. The first call comes from the Lord, you know. And, you know, maybe that's not a good thing, but that's what I did. And that's what my professor said, you know, God will answer that prayer. So the next day he calls me. 
and he'd been on the phone with his committee, and he said, uh, we voted to, to offer you the position, and I about fell over. The first call, Alaska. Didn't know anything about Alaska. Teaching school and being a pastor at the same time. How do you, how do, you do that? Well, we did go to summer school. We accepted the job. And uh, after summer school, by the way, interesting classes, but they weren't helpful. They were all theoretically. No one taught me how to make a lesson plan, you know, and the details. I learned the philosophy of Christian education. Very nice, but how do you use this stuff? Anyway, drove up there. Have you ever been to Alaska? Have you ever drive up there? It's a 3,000 mile trip from, from the Bay Area, and almost half of it went thin, it isn't that way now, it was gravel, dirt road. What a mess, you know? And we, they said, be prepared, bring extra tires with you. You know, a lot of people blow a tire after that many years, that many <laughs> miles on the dirt road, and so we were, we were prepared. Had a tent with us, camped, and anyway, uh, one day, after we'd been driving a while, a rock hit our windshield and completely shattered it. I mean, we couldn't see through it. I didn't know that happened to glass, but this one did. So we had to take it out. Now what do you do? There's no one around. So you drive without a windshield and dust and rain. And we drove for several hours and finally found a gas station. And I said, do you have any windshields? No. <laughs> and he said, but I'll try to order one for you. And he didn't have a telephone out in the middle of nowhere, just a radio. All radio. So he did. He radioed, and we got a we got a, a windshield. About three days later, camped in his, behind the gas station. Anyway, what an experience, you know. Made it to uh, Alaska. Met the president. He showed us the school. Showed us uh, where we we're going to live. The school was in the basement. Church was in the middle. And guess where we lived? In the attic above the church and school. I never had to go anywhere. Didn't have to use my car, you know. What a, what a blessing. God was good. And uh, so before school started, he says, uh, by the way, I, I want you to go to Dillingham. That's where on the west side of the state where all the fishermen go, I think Caleb's been there. And he says, we have a junior camp out there, very primitive, no electricity, you know, no plumbing, there's just uh, outhouses and so forth. But he says, we have a nice little camp out there. We have a lot of native students, Alaskans, uh, Eskimos, go there. And he, I, he said, I'd like you to go. You and Helen can go. OK, what do you want me to do? Shock. You're the director. <laughs> when do I leave? Tomorrow. I said, I've never. I was 21 years old. What do you do? So I prayed about it, you know. I, I obeyed him, and I went over there and met people. I'll make the story short because I've got so much else to share with you, but uh, amazing. What am I going to do? How, do you, how do you lead camp? I've never done it before, you know. And uh, got out there. There's no roads out there. You take a boat, and it's hours to get there, and I won't tell you all the interesting thing getting there. But anyway, after I got there, I noticed a, a little boat come with a little outboard motor, a young man in there, and he, he said, uh, are, you, are you David Escobar? I said, I am. He said, you're the director, right? I said, that's what the president says. He said, have you done it before? I said, no, I have no idea. He says, I've done it. He says, I'll help you. Well, he ended up the director, and I helped him. <laughs> That was the answer to prayer. What do you do? How do you, how, how do you know what to do? Uh, that wasn't the only surprise I had. I should tell you just quickly that uh, we had some answers to prayer. We had a parent that wanted to come visit his kid, and he, he didn't have a boat. All he had was a little airplane. So he flew out there, and there was no airport. So he was going to land on the beach in front of the cabins, you know. And he tried to do it, and he discovered that he was going to end up in the water, in the lake. So he put his brake on, went upside down, broke his prop, and broke his tail. You know, what? now what do you do? He didn't get hurt, you know, and the kids were all over the place. And Oh, my goodness, you know, they were all, thank you, Lord, for protecting him and protecting us. And 
We had one other incident too where we had a, some children in a boat. There's a lot to the story. I will just tell you this much that the boat sunk and these children didn't have life jackets on and it was freezing. The water was just, I mean, you can't hardly survive in like, maybe like Lake Michigan in December or January. And uh, the Lord answered our prayers and they were all rescued. And I, what, a, what a blessing. We had many answers to prayer, but those I never forgot, you know. There's quite a bit to that story. I won't take time for it right now. But anyway, flew back to, Alaska, to Anchorage. And I was, now I was going to try to get, I got met the pastor. And we talked about what he wanted me to do. And they finally assigned me another little church. This is about a year later to take care of. They were just beginning. It was kind of a, just a group. And uh, he said, you take care of that every Sabbath. And you, you can preach or have other people treat, preach. And, and they meet in a bingo hall. He said, you take, take a broom with you. Sweep out all the cigarette butts before Sabbath school and church. I don't have a piano, so bring a tape recorder. And anyway, wow. So before school started, I was asking the president. They didn't have a superintendent. The president was everything, because it was a very small, it was a mission, it wasn't a conference, really. And I said, by the way, who's the principal? You are. I said, I can't do that. I've never ta even taught before. He said, you'll be fine. Look at the Lord's going to take care of you. He brought you here. He'll take care of you. I was in shock. What do you do? You know, first day of school, never taught before, meet my students, I'm the principal, two other teachers, and there were 60 kids in that school, you know, it wasn't that simple, and, but the Lord took care of us. I'll tell you what, I, I never wanted to be a teacher, but I surprised myself, because I loved it. I loved the kids. In fact, that first year, they weren't much younger than me. I was, I turned 22 when school started, and the oldest one was 16, so they were, you know. And I'm still in contact with some of those people. They're in their 70s now, and uh, still serving the Lord. And it's exciting. Met one here this summer. They went to Andrews, and anyway, uh, we made it, survived, God blessed. And after two years of trying to pastor and teach and be principal at the same time, I decided, you know what? I think I would rather stick with education than pastoring because I can be a better pastor as a, as a teacher because I'm with my students every day, five, six hours. Pastor can't do that, you know? And you have a schedule. You know what time it starts. You know what time it's over. You know what you need to do, getting lesson plans and grade papers and so forth. And, and I said, yeah, I, so I went and talked to the president because they were going to send me to the seminary. And I said, you know, I, I just feel impressed that maybe the Lord wants me to stay in education, even though that's what I never wanted to do. And he said, really? I said, yeah. So I said, instead of sending me to the seminary, let me just go back to summer school every summer and I'll get a master's in education. I got a master's in med educational administration at Walla Walla College. and and. Just continued to enjoy school. A few years later, our son was born. A few days, years later, our daughter Cheryl was born. She's an Alaskan, and uh, what a blessing they were to us. We built a school while we were there—a beautiful new school out in the country. And you know, guess who had to help build? I mean, we had to hang sheetrock ourselves and wire and plumb. And I didn't know how to do that stuff. Kurt can tell you I didn't know how to do that stuff. But uh, anyway, one day. I got this strange phone call from the Central California Conference, and Helen and I decided we're staying here. We love Alaska. We're staying here until the Lord comes. And this fellow called. He's, he was a superintendent of schools of Central California Conference. He says, we're looking for uh, teachers. We have several openings. Would you be interested? And I said, you know, we love it here. We're, we're not planning to leave. We're going to stay here. Well, you pray about it. You think about it. And... So we did pray about it, and we thought about it, and talked to some of our friends, some of them back in California, and they said, you know, maybe this would be a good experience for you to get an experience at another school to see how other people operate and how other schools operate. And so we thought, well, maybe the Lord's calling us. So we accepted it, and we moved. And Helen's mother lived real close to where we were teaching that time, and my folks weren't too. My, my father 
my father became the pastor of the Pacific Union College Church, and he was not too far either, so that was good. We enjoyed being that. Soon I became a principal of a junior academy with uh, 10 grades, 200 students, I don't know, 13, 14 teachers, and uh, what an experience that was. I, I learned many lessons there. The first one I learned, I'd been there about two months, and I had a mother come up to me, and she said, may I talk to you? I said, well, sure. So we talked, I mean, I listened, she talked. And she says, uh, Mr. Escobar, she says, things are not going well since you've come. And she told me all my sins, all the things I was doing wrong. And I tried not to get upset, but I, pretty soon I got upset at myself. I, be, I began to believe her. And I was shocked, you know. And I, I talked to our board chairman that day, in fact, and I said, I think I need to resign. He said, what? You've only been here a short time. I said, I know, but let me tell you what happened. I told him, he says, don't pay attention. So that happened to the other principal too. Just forget it, he says, you're doing fine. But I couldn't get over it. I couldn't get over it. And I, I kept thinking about it and I had a hard time sleeping there for several weeks and my appetite was gone and I just, you know, I, just too much. I just, I just, but it was a good experience because when I finally got over it, I didn't ever let that happen to me again. And I worked with many other teachers through my experience that were hurt too. And I could understand, I could sympathize and pray with them and help them through those difficult times. And I never allowed that to happen to me again, but it just about, just about destroyed me. And I think uh, Isaiah 43 too. When you pass through turbulent waters, I will be with you. In Psalms 55, 22, give your burdens to the Lord. That's what I should have done. And he will take care of you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. Praise the Lord for that. And Psalms 16, 8, I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken. I will not. And he is always right beside me. Praise the Lord. While we were in that school, had many miracles take place, one right after another. We developed a work-study program where we had 100 gardens going, two kids to each garden, and uh, developed a, a work program for the older boys building uh, storage sheds. We had a contract with a, with a hardware store, and they were selling them fashion we could build them, and the income helped them with their tuition. You know, it was just wonderful things happened. Couldn't believe it. And then our kids, our own children, Cheryl and her brother, were growing up, and they were middle grades, and I was so busy with the school that I didn't have time to be a father, you know, and, and how I decided, you know, we need, we need to do something different for a while so we can help our kids when they're growing up. And so we, uh, we prayed about it, and the Lord found us a school in northern Idaho, in the Silver Valley of northern Idaho, out in the middle of nowhere, really, with eight students. Two of them were ours, two of them were the chairmen's, two of them were the pastors, and two of them were the fellow that worked in the hospital, one of the administrators. I thought, perfect. I can teach my own children. I'm not sure they like that, but I can teach my own children, and I can spend all day with them. And uh, so registration came, supposed to be eight students, 18 showed up. One teacher, all those grades, how do you do, I'd never done that before. I'd done single grades, you know, and principal for many of those years, and, and uh, wow. So the pastor's wife, she was a certified teacher too, and she, she helped me two hours a day with the little kids with reading and language arts, and otherwise I wouldn't have survived. Anyway, school kept growing, and we ran out of room. We were in the Sabbath school room of this little tiny church, and. And we, had, we were building a, a really rustic log cabin that we were gonna live in, living in a trailer while we were getting ready for it. And it had a basement with glass on one side facing the views, a beautiful view, Coeur d'Alene River and the ski mountain and so forth. And, and so I said to the board, I said, hey, how could I, how, why can't I have school in my house? They said, you can, you know, make sure you have a permit. 
So we got a permit and we moved into our house, the school. And then we kept growing, had to hire another teacher and we had to build another room. So the church came out on Sundays and they helped us build a, a garage. That was a classroom, it became a classroom. Wonderful things happen. We can't thank the Lord. There are some miracles that take place and I don't have time to tell you much of them. But anyway, uh, all of a sudden, the silver mines went on strike and people began to leave and they were stuck on strike. They, they were mad. They didn't want to go on strike, but the company ahead of them put them on strike. And, and uh, we began to lose students. And uh, we had, the hospital was being managed by the Adventist uh, group and they had to leave. There just was not enough, not enough support. Fortunately, the Lord provided us a, a place to go and we, we ended up going to a very exciting town called Boring, Oregon. You know where that is? And uh, Daryl was uh, near there. His daughter came to school there with us, I think third or fourth grade. And he was administrator of the hospital. And we had a, we had a large school there. It was like 240 students. You remember that, right? And a lot of the parents there worked at the hospital. And, uh, it was a wonderful experience, just a wonderful experience. I couldn't believe it, you know, nice school, nice church, nice churches and great support. Lots of things going on and, you know, to move from a tiny little school to principal of a large school was, that was a shock. Of course, I had done it before I went there. Anyway, one day, I'd only been there a short time and I get this phone call, shock, Wisconsin, Wisconsin. He said, we're looking for a superintendent. He said, would you be interested? I said, I never, never thought about being, never interested in that. I mean, no, I don't, I, you know. He says, well, he says, uh, you think about it, you pray about it. Within a few days, the director of education from our union, the upper, uh, anyway, I can't remember the name of the union, came to my office and he said, may I, may I visit with you? I said, yes. He says, you know, I'm friends with the director of education from the Lake Union. And he says, we've been talking about who's gonna to go to Wisconsin and, and we think you should do it. I said, I've only been here a couple of years and your school's easy, it's in good shape. And you remember, it was a good school. And, and he says, my associate, he's retiring and he's been a principal and he's willing to finish the year for, finish, you may have to go be, yeah, he said, they need you now. They're hiring teachers, they're doing all kinds of things. I said, I've never done that. He says, you'll be fine. God will be with you. Wow. So we ended up going to Wisconsin. And that was a miracle because, listen to this, if we hadn't gone to Wisconsin, Cheryl might not have gone to Andrews University. And because she was at Andrews University, she found Kurt. So you three grandchildren, I hadn't been for Wisconsin, but the Lord can do it different ways, but that, that happened. We were blessed and we had some really big challenges in Wisconsin. I won't tell you about them because you might know some of the people involved. It was, it was, it was something, just something. I couldn't believe it. I, you know, I'd never been a superintendent before. And, but there were a lot of good things that happened too. And after I was there a few years, the president said, uh, you know, we'd like to ordain you as a gospel minister. I said, well, I'm not a pastor, you know, a teacher. He says, you are a pastor. You're a pastor to the teachers. And he, I, I was over, couldn't believe it, you know. But appreciated that kind of support. And uh, finally, the union president from Lake Union came to Madison, Wisconsin and held the ordination. I, I just... I was over, overwhelmed, you know, I couldn't believe. Good things happen among the bad things. And I mean, there were some really, Alice, you were there, you know about it. And uh, so what happens next? The president comes into my office, president of the Wisconsin Conference, Leonard Jake, no, not Leonard Jakes, that was another one. Anyway, he came in and he says, Arnie Swanson, I think was his name, yes. Some of you may know him, good man. Came in, he says, uh, there's a phone call for you. And I said, you know, usually the secretary tells me, not the president comes into my office. I said, what is it? He said, never mind. Just, I'll give you the answer. Oh, what's the question? Never mind. 
The answer is no. <laughs> I had no idea. I had no idea. We'd been there like about four years, and so I picked up the phone. I keep getting these shocking phone calls, you know, and this one was a president of the Hawaii conference. What? He said, uh, we're looking for a superintendent, and we've already agreed to ask you if you'll come. And I said, well, I've only been here four years. And uh, then I got a call from the union director here uh, in, in this union, and he says, you don't want to go to Hawaii and know all about it. He says, if you go there, you go to the middle of the ocean, you're done. People will forget about you. Your career is over with. I said, well, thanks for telling me, you know. I mean, it was kind of attractive to go to Hawaii, you know. We visited there. I always thought it would be a nice, you know, it's a nice visit, but I don't think I want to live here, you know. And uh, there's a lot of issues, of course. Well, pretty soon I thought, you know, I'm going to call to get some recommendations from the North American Division because the fellow who was in the Northwest who told me to go to Wisconsin, now he was the director of education at the North American Division. So I called the North American Division office to talk to him and the secretary says, what's your name? I gave him my name. He says, okay, I'll get him. So he comes to the phone and he doesn't say, hello or how are you? What's going on? He says two things. Yes, go. <laughs> how do you know what's going? I think he put my name in probably. He says, you'll be told that if you go, your career's over with. And he said, let me tell you, he says, I spent 10 years there. I was principal of the academy, and my career's not over. And he says, you need to go. Prayed about it, and we decided we would go. Now we were leaving our children in Andrews University, and we're going to Hawaii. And it makes sense. So they got to fly home on vacations, and uh, Charlie used to work in the summertime there, doing architectural things, as I recall. And... Uh, we loved Hawaii. We had challenges there too. I mean, there were there were people that didn't always speak nice and this kind of stuff. It, you have that everywhere in every kind of occupation, right? But we loved it. And uh, again, I don't know why it kept happening, but I get a phone call, and I told you this in another sermon. You may remember it, so I'll tell it quickly. But this time it's the Washington Conference calling. They didn't interview me. They just said. Uh, we're offering you a position uh, in our conference as superintendent. I said, wow, I said, I'm, I'm really, I've only been here a short time, been here four years and not ready to go. He says, you pray about it. God will answer your prayer. And he says, I don't, I don't care if you say yes or no. I just want to know what God tells you. So he says, give me, uh, give me two weeks. I'll call you in two weeks and you tell me what the Lord told you. We did pray about it but no indication we should go, nothing. In fact, our president there in Hawaii kept telling me almost every day, he said, you don't want to go, you know, you've only been here a short time. And anyway, the morning that he was going to call that afternoon from the president of Washington, I left home, had worship, prayed with Helen. We talked, shall we go? And we said, we haven't any indication that we should go. The Lord has not told us that, so we're staying. So I got to the office, and after the worship in the office, that was a Monday morning, my secretary said, may I talk to you? I said, sure. She said, I, I heard about this offer you had yesterday. She said, I prayed for you. And she said, don't misunderstand me, but I think the Lord's calling you. I said, you do? I said, why? She said, I don't know. I was impressed. And shortly after that, the president, the Hawaii Congress, called me into his office, and he says, you know what I've been telling you, that you shouldn't go, and you haven't been here long enough and all along. He said, last night I couldn't sleep. And he said, I kept waking up. I was praying for you, and he said, I was impressed. The Lord is calling you. I said, how do you know? He said, I don't know. I just have that impression. Wow. And shortly after that, I get a third call. This one's from the union office, the Pacific Union. Kind of my boss up there, you know, director of education there. And he says, uh, Brother Escobar, he says, I know all about this call to Washington. He says, we're not, not telling you you should leave. But he said, uh, I think you should. <laughs> he said, I think it'd be, you know, there's opportunities there. You know, you have a bigger staff, you have an associate, and 
and lots going on, you should accept it. Then, right after that, I get a call from the Washington College. He says, yes or no? He says, if it's no, I'm done. I won't say anymore. If it's yes, praise the Lord. But he says, we want the Lord's will. What did the Lord tell you? And I said, well, up till this morning, I got no answer. But I, had, I told him what happened that morning. He says, that mean you're coming? I said, I think that means we're coming. And we arrived there, huge challenges. I mean, huge. I say million dollar, literally a million dollar char challenge at one of our, our schools. And, and uh, personnel issues, uh, just, and the president called me into his office there and he says, before you get going too far, he says, here are the challenges. I said, no one told me about that. <laughs> I know, he says, but you need to focus on that. And so I would say, Lord, I don't, I don't have any answer. I don't, I don't have any idea what to do. I prayed, you know. And to tell you the truth, I, I didn't know what to do. But at the end of that school year, the Lord had answered my prayer and those problems. The million dollar problem was solved. Can't tell you about it because you might know somebody there. And uh, the personnel problems got much better. And uh, just praise the Lord, you know. I couldn't believe it because I, I couldn't do anything. God did it all. You know, I mean, I let him use me, but uh, praise the Lord. Anyway, things were going pretty well after a while, and we actually started a new academy up in Kirkland, and uh, several things were happening. Auburn Academy is where Cheryl went to school. It was a beautiful school, large boarding school. And we had a new principal there. We became good friends. We worked together in Wisconsin and in, in Washington. And anyway, make a long story short, I get another call. One of these strange calls. I don't know why. You can't stay put very long. And this time it's the president of the Northern California Conference. And I thought, oh, brother, I don't. That, that's a very difficult one. They had 4,000 students and 300 teachers, and they had a staff of eight in the education office, including secretaries and superintendents, and, and uh, 10 academies. I, 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 don't want, I don't want to do that. And the man that said, said I should go to Wisconsin, he says you go to Hawaii, he said you shouldn't go to Northern Cal. He said there are challenges there. You think you have them in Washington. And so, uh, President says, you, you pray, and uh, I'll call you back. In the meantime, I talked to the principal at the academy, and he says, uh, David, you don't really want to go, do you? I said, I, I really don't. Uh, there were some good things there, too. And uh, he said, I have an idea. He said, you pray. First of all, you tell the president, no, you're not coming. And then you pray, and you say, Lord, if he calls back and he says, will you reconsider, figure the Lord's talking. Well, that's a simple prayer. I don't know if that's a good idea or not, but I thought, hey, I'm going to try it. So I prayed, and he called me back, and I, I told him no. He was friendly, nice, and uh, hung up, and about two or three weeks later, he calls again, and I thought, uh-oh. And this time he says, I have the name of three people we're considering, and do you know them? I knew some of them. He says, can you tell me something about them? And, so I told what I did know, and we had a nice conversation right to the end of the call, just getting ready to say goodbye. He says, oh, by the way, would you reconsider? <laughs> so we went to the Northern California Conference, and there was huge challenges, but the Lord was there. Great things did happen. Not all the problems were solved, but you don't expect that, do you? But God blessed, and we actually enjoyed our time there. It was and then all those moves, years went by. I had 40 years in and had a health issue and retired and decided, where were we going to retire? Well, decided to go back to Hawaii because my sister was there. Her husband was a pastor, and we would all retire together. And we were there several years when the president of the Hawaii conference calls me, and he says, uh, our superintendent just left, and we don't have anyone to take over, and we're looking for someone. I know you're not interested because you've been retired for several years, but he says, would you help us out? He says, give us a month or two while we're looking, and I finally said, sure, I'll be glad to come and help you. He says, you won't have to do all the things normally the superintendent does because they were director of communications and education and several other departments. He says, just take care of the schools. So I said, uh, 
I'll do it for a couple of months. Long story short, two years. <laughs> and uh, then we finally retired and came to the, back to the mainland. And thanks to Brother Kurt, we came to Michigan. He got us a house right next door to him. and That was an answer to prayer. And we love living next to our daughter and her family. And we love this church. We feel like we've made good friends here. You've been so supportive of us. It's hard being old and moving, you know, it's starting over all over again. But God is good. And you know, I, I think back over those years, God does answer prayers. He does. I didn't want to be an educator. I didn't want to move so many times. I didn't ask to move so many times. But God, it was his will. He kept, kept moving us. And, and amazing. I, mean, I made many mistakes. I wasn't perfect, that's for sure. But God blessed us in spite of it. I just can't thank him enough. Psalms 145, 3. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Right? Great is the Lord. I think, if you think back over all those years, and great is the Lord and great. I survived. And I don't think I did anything great. I just, the Lord gave me something to do and he, he used me to make a difference. Lamentations 3. Great is his faithfulness. His loving kindness begins afresh each day. My soul claims the Lord as my inheritance, therefore I will hope in the Lord. You know that verse, don't you? And I appreciate what God's done. I appreciate him trusting me in so many ways. I just can't thank him enough. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, New mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Can't thank him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for you taking people that, like me, Father, and asking me to do things I'm not prepared to do, don't feel qualified. And thank you for trusting us to do your work, Father. Thank you for trusting each one of us in this church today. We all have responsibilities. Thank you for using us. Thank you for the way this church ministers to each other. Thank you for our pastor, Father. What a blessing. Once more, I have to say, great is thy faithfulness. Amen. Please stand and join us in singing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Thy faithfulness. 
you and how can we thank you enough for your faithfulness to us, for trusting us to do your work, Father. I pray for each one of us now as we go from this place that you will use us to share the good news to those around us. May Jesus be seen in us, Father. Thank you for being with us and for speaking to our hearts today is my prayer in Jesus' name.